Hi, all. Welcome to the business of wine. My name is Kat Ferrante, and I work on the alumni relations team at Granger Hall. And I am so delighted to be hosting this event and learning more about the business of wine. This event is part of a larger ongoing series here at the business school called The Business Of, where alumni share their insights on the business side of your favorite things. Um, today's focus is obviously wine. And we have two amazing panelists here today to show you what it's like to transform a little grape into a lot of wine and how that wine makes it onto the table of consumers like us. I'll start by introducing our panelists, asking them some questions, many of them which were submitted um, by our attendees prior to the event. So thank you so, so much for those. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the group, um, from people who are live on YouTube. So audience members, feel free to comment and send us questions in the chat. And we're going to get to as many as we possibly can um, before our time is out. So with that, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. First today, we have Claire Nitschke who got her BA in political science from UW-Madison in 2016, but her life took a turn after working a first harvest in Willamette Valley, Oregon. From Laguna Franca Wine in Oregon, she then worked in two Michelin-starred restaurants and got her W set in New York. She has since worked in Austria, Italy, France, New York, and California. And presently, Claire is actually joining us from Germany today. She's in her final year for MSc Vinifera, Enology and Viticulture in Geisenheim, Germany. <laughs> After her thesis researching sulfur dioxide alternatives in winemaking, Claire will be moving to the south of France to work at a vineyard. Um, next up, we have Angela Shi, and she is the director, Senior Director of Commercial Insights at Treasury Wine Estates, which is a global company with well-known brands such as 19 Crimes. Angela has been at Treasury Wine Estates for over three years, but Angela started her career after getting her BBA from WSB in 2000 at IRI Nielsen before deciding to move to the supplier side. Since then, Angela has worked on various projects, ranging from concepts to package testing and ethnographies, helping the organization make strategic decisions based on consumer sentiments and trends. So first of all, a huge, huge thank you to you both for being here and sharing your time and insights with us today. I'm really excited to hear more. Um, but first off, I would love to hear you guys just talk a little bit about yourselves for the audience um, one by one. So Claire, you're studying enology and viticulture, which is the study of wine and cultivating grapevines. And you've also had experiences at wineries all across the globe. I would love to hear about how your journey into winemaking and grape cultivation began and what has kept you wanting to explore this career more. Sure, yeah. I studied um, political science at Madison and went out to Washington, D.C. and was working an internship there in the Senate and um, sort of came to the sad realization that I don't think this was for me and um, was actually working at a restaurant on the Capitol Square my um, junior and senior year. And the bosses there, um, Lucas Henning, who it, I think it just closed actually after the pandemic, but Graft on the Capitol Square, mm -hmm. they were um, educators through the WSCT and really encouraged me in cultivating my wine knowledge and sent me off to Oregon. They're like, you can't stay here after graduation. You got to go. <laughs> so I went out and worked to harvest in Oregon. I had no idea what that meant. I bought a pair of boots and um, got on a plane. <laughs> and um, I I caught the bug, as they say, and um, loved it. Went straight to Austria from that harvest. I was working with some Austrians. They're like, okay, if you, if you want to, you got to come right now. I was like, okay. <laughs> and um, then moved to New York to really um, study more focused on the international wines. And in New York, you have access to wines that you don't necessarily have access to in Madison. So I got to experience a whole range of the spectrum. And, studied and was working in a winery in Brooklyn as well and decided um, although restaurants are so much fun to work in I really preferred the labor of, um, of the cellar and of the vineyard so I went out to Italy and then back to Oregon and started the transition from the cellar and customer service and tasting rooms to the vineyard and was working in a vineyard and then um, met my partner who also works in the industry and decided um, post pandemic that we're not gonna do this, um, do this separation thing. And I applied for school in Europe. So now we are, we are here. Incredible. Um, 
cheers on a very different kind of uh, career path, Angela. You work on the commercial insight side of the wine industry. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like, maybe day to day, and how your insights affect the choices of other people on your team, and what you got you what got you interested in the wine industry? Yeah. So first off, thank you for inviting me to speak on this panel. Super excited about sharing my knowledge of wine from an insights perspective. Um, so from a, a day to day, it really just varies uh, based on who in the organization, what we're talking to. It could be anything from building out investor decks based on insights and trends, what's happening in market, total wine perspective, down to, you know, it, it, it's the way I think about my organization or the way I run my team is in three different pillars, right? One is looking at internal depletions information. So how are we against our DAOP or our you know, overall goal for the year? Um, and where are those gaps and opportunities? Second is, as we think about opportunities from that perspective, where think where should we think about innovation, right? So what's the white space as it goes against uh, varietals or price points, the way that wine is segmented, especially here in the US, um, and as well as globally, we think about it from you know the commercial tier, which is essentially from a US perspective, anything below $8, premium is around eight to 10 to 20, and then you have your luxury wine, and then super luxury and everything that is outside of my price range that I can't purchase. But, you know, as we think about innovation and we think about the consumers, right? So when I came on to work at Treasury, it was really about, let's not talk to ourselves. Let's think about it from a consumer focused perspective. And that sort of leads into the third uh, or second or third component of my job is understanding, you know, how trends are looking at and why are trends operating the way they are? Why are consumers entering at higher price points? What's their style and their preferences? Um, as it relates to, you know, wines uh, or actual branding, marketing is huge, right? As we end of the day, how do we, as we call unwind wine, um, wine is also as clear, <laughs> no, the uh, sort of as stuffy or pretentious or the knowledge based on that is, is a lot, you know, and I know Kat, you and I were talking about this earlier, like, has your palate changed over time? It's like, absolutely coming in and, and consuming wine has definitely been different uh, with my journey here at Treasury. And then, um, you know, I think it just goes into like running focus groups um, as well as ethnographies, uh, any sort of pack testing. So, you know, at the end of the day, from a day-to-day -day perspective, it's really what do the consumers like? How do we market to them? And how do we create wines that connect to them? Um, and in terms of like what got me interested, I'm obviously in the Bay Area. So huge wine country. I love wine. Um, it just was a natural step in my career, progression of my career. Uh, and I, I wanted to do something different. So um, wine is complex. It's amazing, as Claire can get into as well, in terms of how it's produced and, and the care from it. But there's just so many other steps that goes into that bottle. So true. I'm really excited to hear more about that process as we move forward. Um, thank you both. I'm really so excited to have you both here. Um, let's dive right in. So first off, it's very clear that you guys work on quite different parts of the very long and detailed process of getting a good wine to a contented consumer. So from your individual perspective, how do the different positions at a vineyard, um, at a vineyard or a winery kind of work together to make that perfect bottle? Um, yeah, so it really depends on who the consumer is. For me, there's people who consider the perfect bottle one that might not have touched any or maybe one set of human hands before it came to them. The industrial massive wineries that are hugely important for, for many consumers that have mechanized operations and can produce really clear standard and a lot of bottles at once. But then there are others that maybe 30 pairs of hands have touched from the vineyard workers to the pruners, to the people who are harvesting the grapes, sorting the grapes, cellar master, the bottling line, the people who are everywhere in between. So um, I think there's a lot of things that can, as we always say in the industry, it depends, <laughs> you know, it really depends. But um, I don't think there's a lot of quote unquote bad wine. I think there's the right wine for the right people and you just have to find that yeah and if i could layer on top of that you know claire's job is producing the best wines or best best grapes 
possible. So thank you for all the hard work that you do from that perspective. And then it goes down to the winemaking style or perspective, right? And so the winemakers um, are really tasked to preserve the quality um, and, and the, the, the actual the essence of those grapes into the wine itself. And it, it really goes down to styles, what Claire is talking about, um, the personality of, of the wine and, and how it ties into that brand, right? So as we think about Cabernets and with Treasury and how many brands that we have that produces Cabernets, but if you taste each one of them, they have their own specific element and stylized based on the winemakers um, in terms of really connecting back to the history of the wines or to the consumers in terms of what they want to taste. And so with that, um, as we think about the perfect bottle, we go into a lot of sensory testing, taste tests, which is you know not a bad part of my job too as well, uh, but really understanding blind tastings, like what, how does this taste in comparison to our competitors? Is it sweeter? Is it drier? Tannins, you know, um, full bodied versus light bodied. And how does that translate to the consumers and through an insights perspective? It's all about tracking those numbers and repeat rates, right? We know if a consumer buys it, it's all about trial. We have to get it into their hands first. And then it, the the power of the wine itself is comes through from a data perspective in terms of repeat. Wow, that is so fascinating. Like both of you mentioned that there are just so many people involved in this process. That is so in, like fascinating. I mean, as someone who simply buys a bottle of wine, like I think I know, but I don't know, you know? <laughs> Um, you have the most power in this industry. We have a huge oversupply of wine in the world. So <laughs> just keep on drinking. As long as we can communicate with you. Uh, and then you can, I can do you that. Back to Angela. <laughs> I'll do my part. Good. Um, awesome. In that kind of vein, Angela, you mentioned um, like seeing what trends are happening. Um, I would love to ask both of you kind of what trends you see happening in the wine industry right now and how your unique position. Um, either cultivating the grapes or doing those consumer insights, how do you respond to those trends? Yeah, so from that perspective, um, always at a macro level, always wanting to know how is wine doing as a whole. Um, there's a lot of different components as we think about how it's being delivered through the different channels of the U.S. You have on-premise restaurant and bars, which Claire never, never wants to step a foot in at all. And then you will have your off-premise, like your grocery stores, your liquor stores, um, and, and all the different sub-channels underneath that too as well. I mean, holistically, at the end of the day, wine is declining, as, as Claire was saying, but there's a lot of, as you start to peel back, and it's not declining, not like beer, which is double digits decline, but it's down slightly. Um, but as you start to peel back the onion, there are nuggets of gold um, that can help from a, for Claire, from a cultivating wine perspective, what consumers want. We know that the category itself is premiumizing. People are purchasing at a higher price point. And then we also know that people are entering at a higher price point too as well. So I think about back in the days when I was at Madison, I would go in and buy my three box of dollar box of Franzia and just think that's amazing. Consumers are no longer gravitating that way. They're looking for more quality. And as we think about how the evolution of technology, people are smarter, they're more educated. They, they have their cell phones, right? They can go with Avino or do whatever apps to really learn and educate mm -hmm. themselves. That sort of lends to a higher uh, desire or a, 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 what's the word, uh, a need to, to cultivate better better quality wines. And as we think about Gen Zers too as well, so Kat, you will fit into this as well. Um, you guys are, we, I said to you all the time, um, you know, you guys are a different breed than, than what was we would consider 20 years ago, right? So more based on quality versus quantity, you really care about what you put in your body. So these are certain trends that we, we study and there's, you know, a huge increase of moderate uh, mid-strength as what we call wines mm -hmm. uh, that kind of parallel with like the white claws of the world, you know, lower ABV, 7%-ish. Um, no mom wants to go, although who loves wine, is not going to go to a pool and drink a 14% ABV multiple times, like multiple cans, and then just be completely drunk. So, you know, it, it's so it's it's sort of to that point, like, how do we think about the peeling back the onion and, and looking at those areas of opportunities, BFY, um, you know, mid-strength wines, uh, premium wines, and then also thinking about from a category cross-category perspective, 
uh, you know, you see blurrings of everything from an RTD perspective, Jameson and Coke, and you have Mike's Hard Lemonade and all that stuff too. Like, how do we make, you know, what are those trends that are happening that can be translated to wine as well? Yeah, from a production standpoint, the the response to trends is much different as um, we're like at the vineyard we work at, um, if we replant, we're not thinking about maybe the Gen Z consumer. We have to think about their children or their nieces and nephews because you plant a grapevine and that's for the next, hopefully, I mean, the average is usually 40 years, but hopefully longer than that, if you can treat the vines right and get them to have a nice long longevity, especially like in California, those are, vines are so beautiful and all those were planted by people in the 1800s that weren't necessarily thinking about the internet or the consumer trends now. And um, so it's much slower. And as a producer, we really have to figure out ways to package our wine and work with the actual middle branding and everything in between because these vines are not um, in fashion, like fashion, you know, they're really long-term investments. Yeah. That is so, so fascinating. And I didn't really know um, uh, like how much thought kind of went into like the, like you said, like the ABV content. I kind of thought that that was like whatever the wine was, it was. So that's really interesting to think about like um, that focusing. But this is kind of a follow-up that I think is just kind of fun. Have you either of you seen any kind of like exciting or unique choices um, in winemaking or selling that might not yet be considered trends per se, but kind of like spark your interest? Yeah, I mean, with climate change being a huge focus and a huge um, meta existential crisis that we're all facing every day as farmers, we're really really see that every day in all of our choices. And so one of the biggest trends we're looking at is reducing our carbon footprint. And with the premiumization of wine and with people entering, wanting that higher quality end product, a lot of times associated with that is the heavier glass bottle, but glass production is one of the biggest carbon producers of mm -hmm. the entire chain of um, winemaking. And so I'm excited about people switching the association necessarily you can have a beautiful wine that's bag and box. And from years ago, recently, if you see a bag and box wine, you're not going to associate that with premium wine or luxury wine. But I'm hoping that some of this trends towards more sustainable and um, responsibility choicing will lead towards more canned wines and lighter glass bottles and alternative packaging that maybe no one's thought of yet. But I'm excited to sort of break the association with you can have a really good quality and alternative packaging. Yeah, definitely what Claire was saying from a external packaging perspective, it's something that we always as treasury um, review every single day as far as how do we become sustainable and, and think about the environment to, you know, looking at our lightweight bottles, even down to labels, um, screw caps or things that we talked about. I, I think it's hard to, from that, changing the, the consumer's mindset, especially, you know, the younger consumers are like, oh, I like the whole thing of, even though it's inconvenient, but the whole, you know, getting the cork and unscrewing it because it provides a sense of, it's an experience, right? But I mean, at the end of the day, just unscrew it and just pour your wine, you're fine. You get the same experience at the end <laughs> when you finish the bottle. But, um, but also from that perspective, uh, from an internal wine perspective, like trends, as we think about um, additives into wine, whether it be relaxing, any sort of, uh, you know, all the uh, different types of additives that could help provide from a wellness perspective. These mm -hmm. are things that are, may not happen, are happening at this moment. If there's a lot of, as you were saying, cat, like the background work that has to go, it's not like you can get a bottle of wine and pour collagen in it and shake it up and give it to a consumer, right? So there's there's a lot of things from a taste profile that we have to consider. Um, but, you know, these are things that we're, we're looking at. Um, obviously, natural, organic, um, there, there's a lot of production um, limitations. You can't go at scale for that, but you see it localized too as well in your neighborhood winery. So, you know, these are things that we're looking at too. But I think at the end of the day, as a, a mass producer, we always have to like think about the back end um, cogs as well as you know, how to produce it at a, 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 you know, efficient way. 
Yeah, I love that both of you brought up things about sustainability and climate change and like how that is very exciting to both of you that there is this movement towards um, sustainability inside of the wine industry. So I want to um, kind of explicitly move to address that a little um, a little more. I do just want to say that one of my favorite wines in the whole world is bagged and boxed, and it is the smoothest Cabernet I've ever drank. <laughs> So anyone out there who's still skeptical, I would just like to say alternative packaging, she can do it. Um, but on to talking about sustainability, we actually received a lot of questions from viewers that really wanted to hear more about the wine industry's intersection within the environment and sustainability. I mean, it is inherently linked. It is about, um, you know, growing something and then transforming it. So in conversation with global climate change, how has climate change and the trends that you were talking about towards environmental sustainability affect your practice and the wine industry in general? I know you guys have already touched on some of the things, but I'd love to hear more about it. Well, from a production perspective, it touches everyday decisions, long-term decisions. It affects even um, when my first harvest, the the dates are becoming early and earlier. The actual mm -hmm. hang time of the grapes are changing. Grapes that we've grown historically in areas for hundreds and hundreds of years are now incompatible with the climate of that <laughs> place right now. You can't grow grapes to the same quality that you that your grandparents have, that their grandparents have, that their great grandparents have. And so it's really um, sort of shocking, especially in the European climates where I am, where historical cold climate. I was talking to my friend here in Germany and he was like, my grandfather would probably have, you know, died before he would consider acidifying his wine. And now the wines are, the climate is so hot that the acidity drops so significantly and the alcohol, as we were talking earlier, is a huge consumer issue where high ABVs, but that's directly associated with climate change and the temperature of the growing season, the sugar mm -hmm. development and, um, so there are so many things and thankfully where I am, uh, where we are in the south of France, we're one of the biggest areas of organic viticulture and the vineyard that um, is in my partner's family, it's been farmed conventionally for a long time, but now I have a stepson and if he wants to go running around in the vineyards, you know, I'm worried about any sort of pesticides or products on that end. So I think when a lot of these were introduced, they weren't there weren't, they didn't have the information we have now where they thought they were doing the right thing for their vineyard. They're eliminating the pests, they're controlling the environment, but now with um, climate change being the focus that it is today, the, the adaptation is really um, taking full front and there are more organic producers, there are more people leading, leaving away pesticides and I'm optimistic. It's not easy, but I'm optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, and what Claire was saying, if I can add on, like no other uh, crops are more uh, susceptible to climate change, right? So the warmer the temperature, the sweeter the grapes, right? And that changes everything from how you know the, the styles and the winemaking, you know, the, the making of the wine. So it's also a consideration if you have a, a warmer uh, growth, uh, a hotter summer, you have to harvest earlier uh, and, and all of that too. Um, and so it helps it from a organization perspective, you know, changing and the changing of how you trellis the grapes, um, training the, the workers. Um, and so there's a lot of things that even go into the soils, right? If we talk about sustainability and the biodiversity of the actual ground itself. So it's not just the grapes itself, but everything that surrounds it too. And it goes into a lot of conversations like for our treasury, we have one of the largest um, uh, states of, of wine um, vineyards in, in NorCal. So, you know, we partner with uh, the county in terms of understanding water, water usages and strategies, making sure that we um, you know, reuse the water too as smartly as we can and make sure it's shared amongst um, all the other 
partners within the area. Um, we are looking at renewable energy as well. So we want to become um, net zero by 2030 um, from that perspective, looking at everything from lightweight bottles to recyclable packages, zero scaping at our wineries too. Um, it, we So that's one of the things too from a water usage going to uh, drought resistant um, plants too. So and electric fleets, like how do we become solar uh, powered focused versus versus not. So there's there's a lot of conversations that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis as we think about being uh, on the cutting edge and leading that from a sustainability and environmental perspective. But definitely we, we have a whole team that leads it, which is, which is awesome. It's so exciting to hear that there's so many different aspects and so many different possible solutions for different parts of the problem um, where climate change is affecting the winemaking industry, like on, like you said, packaging, like cork, but then there's also all the water, hotter summers, yeah. that like, it really is um, kind of inside of every aspect of the winemaking industry. And it's so exciting to hear that there are people um, kind of focusing on each of those areas. And like you said, Claire, that there's like hope, even though it is very difficult. So um, adaptation, here we go. Um, one thing also that our viewers were curious about, and we kind of mentioned a little bit um, offhandedly, was about how wines vary in so many different ways. And that includes the process, the color, the taste, and also the price. And so some viewers would love to know more about like why some wines cost so much more than others. And is it something about the grapes themselves, the process in which they're cultivated, the geographical location of the vineyard, business decisions. I guess now I'm like the glass in the bottle. I didn't even know that was part of it. You know, just kind of um, what kind of accounts for the wide range of prices that you see on the shelf. I can speak of it from a business perspective and Claire, maybe you can layer on from a, 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 a viticulture as well, but I would say the answer is D, all the above. <laughs> um, so it has everything to do, if you think about from five different perspectives, like the production, uh, route to market, uh, business aspect, right? Uh, branding, consumer, all of these drive price points. And if I go back to number one with the production, bulk wine versus hand-selected wines, the type of varietals, Cabernet, Savion is probably a little bit more expensive than producing Merlots. Um, Appellation, Napa is more expensive in general, just Napa is expensive. So the cost <laughs> of, of you know, the, the property taxes and everything versus a central coast or other regions could play into it, which also produces better grapes, right? So it's not just Napa, we're going to slap on a higher price point, but the grapes themselves are cultivated and are, are really great quality through years of experience um, and, and care. Uh, farming, so hand selected, what's Clara saying, versus machine, bulk wine, Trader mm -hmm. Joe's, um, two buck chuck, and, and the sheer volume of it too as well, right? If you produce bulk wine, you could probably produce it at a cheaper price point versus smaller batches, command a higher price point. Uh, route to market, so whether or not it's D to C, direct to consumers, you're cutting out the middleman, so you're cutting out all those costs and going in terms of going straight to the consumer's table uh, from a wholesale perspective, imported versus domestic tariffs. If I want to ship to to Claire, you know, and her purchase my wines and, and vice versa, too, as well. Um, and then public versus private. Obviously, from a private company perspective, you have a little bit more flexibility in terms of pricing versus we have to. And I was talking to you, Kat, you know, working with the investors and making sure that. Everyone's happy at the end of the day. Uh, and then branding costs associated to, as we talk about 19 crimes and, and Snoop Dogg royalties or anything that we have to do from an advertisement perspective and getting names out there to the consumers. And then I think it then ultimately leads to the consumers, right? So what do they want? What sort of price points they want? But then that also commands quality. I'm not gonna buy a $20 bottle of wine knowing that it was cheaply produced at a $3 bottle of wine, right? So. I think a lot of these factors um, kind of play into that that perfect price point uh, in which not only delivers the quality, but also um, the expectation of what a consumer thinks about when they're purchasing a $20 bottle of wine versus a, an $8 bottle of wine. So yeah, Claire, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and then that I think um, all of those points that you listed in your question there might not be a huge difference between the production of like a three bottle 
dollar, dollar bottle of wine and a seven dollar bottle of wine but between a three dollar or seven dollar and a twenty dollar bottle of wine that cost of production is a huge huge increase and in everything from everything that angela listed and then the the demand price for organic wines and sustainably mm -hmm. farmed wines fair and green wines everything that consumer puts value on that also costs more in the production side the the protections on the vine you have to go through the vineyard more hours of labor more um, cost of gasoline, uh, more people actually doing the work to produce wine that then the value increases for the consumer, whether or not it produces a better end product or not. If the consumer values it, it is something that will also cost on the production end. I really love that perspective that, um, A, as you, Angela, gave such an amazing description about all the different things that go into it. But also, like you said, that there are some things that don't necessarily affect the taste, but are still valued by the consumer that like raise that price point up. And so like, yeah, I've had an amazing $5 bottle of wine, but like, are there things that I value that I'm compromising on by, you know, um, by purchasing that? That's a really valuable and maybe and maybe not you know that's the thing maybe and maybe <laughs> not um but that is really interesting i want to combine um a question that i kind of had prepared from registrants which one with one that's being asked um of us now so the question that i have for you because we have the luxury of having someone um based in california and someone based or with a lot of experience in europe i wanted to ask kind of about the differences and ask what are the top areas in the world for wine? You already mentioned Napa, um, Angela, and kind of wondering if there are large differences in the processes of how vineyards are maintained and how wines are produced and or the general mindset around winemaking um, between Europe and the United States. And I want to then specify that we did have one question um, from a viewer named Molly that was wondering specifically about sulfates and if the wines in Europe do not contain sulfates and if that's true or if that's like kind of one of those things you we were talking about that the consumer values, um, do we think that that's going, we're going to be seeing more of that in the United States potentially? Well, I'll answer that one really quick. Um, so there are sulfates in all wine, no matter what, it's a natural byproduct of fermentation and so the levels are hugely variable and the international wine organization the wve i think it's the acronym in europe is there are limits on how much you can put in so i think in red wines it's a little bit lower than in white wines because sulfites are so sulfur dioxide what you use in wine making is an antiseptic and antibacterial wine itself is a living product and it's perishable inherently so in order to give it more protection and to all of the chemicals reactions that are happening in the bottle wine we don't need to get into but it is um it is widely used in europe there is a little bit of um sort of a perception that it's it's not because the limits are lower so for red wine i think it's 150 milligrams by liter and for white wine it's a little bit higher at 200 but um a lot of people have the articles I read, the clickbait, and um, some scientific papers associate the lower sulfites with lower um, risk of hangover the next day. <laughs> and one of the things that I've sort of found throughout working in this industry for the last eight years, I be closely, more closely associated with lower alcohol levels coming out of Europe with the cooler climate. Mm. And some people are very allergic to sulfates and should not drink wine that has any added sulfates if you are taking histamines for asthma or whatnot, um, stay away from, we don't want you having a reaction, stay away from wines with extra sulfites, but they do occur in all natural wines. I don't know if that's a clear answer or not. Again, it depends. <laughs> yeah, and I can speak from a top production perspective. So in terms of top volumes sold by country, US is the number one uh, leading um, volumes sold, but from a production perspective, it's actually Italy, led by France and then the US. So, you know, in terms of volume sold or volume produced, um, you know, we, we love here in the US, we love our wines for sure. So, 
But I think from a winemaking perspective, and Claire, maybe you can speak to us as well. I mean, I think as we talk about the different appellations and climates and whether the soils and stuff really just really, um, you know, it really dries in terms of the different winemaking styles. Um, and then obviously different countries produce or have the ability to to do grapes better than others, right? So we're talking about Germany and Rieslings, um, you know, Cabernets is South, you know, in France as well, um, you know, or, or just here in California in general, cabs do really well just because of the hot suns. Um, Pinot Noirs are a little temperamental, so coastal, cooler climates and, and so forth. So, um, and then each style is different in terms of how they and Claire, maybe you can speak a little more, but how they, they care for the, the grapes too. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a hard, big question to answer, but um, I agree with the different regions and, you know, people sort of laughed when, um, when people wanted to plant Pinot Noir in Oregon because it's, there's so much rain, it's not gonna work. But um, there are so many factors involved, and Oregon is considered very similar to Burgundy in the mm -hmm. sense that it is very similar latitudinally and, um, and climate-wise, but there's a lot of differences there as well, even though there's similar hours of sunlight in Burgundy and Oregon. In Oregon, it's concentrated to the summer months. We don't get any rain in the summer in Oregon, usually. And so these places all over the world I think Europe has a advantage marketing wise and historic that these practices have been honed over hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years and really um, spe you know, specified and Riesling does well in Germany, but that was trial and error. And America, we're so much younger and the climate is changing so quickly in our lifetimes that um, I, I really appreciate the US that you're able to sort of um, pivot and change and you're not tied to the tradition of in Burgundy you need to be Pinot Noir in California you're famous for the cab and that'll do well in the market but you can try anything really yeah. and yeah. I think that's a huge advantage yeah I think we always talk about like new to world versus old world right uh, just the heritage built into specific countries in Europe versus in the U.S. it's a little bit more fluid yeah and the bulk industry is um, not something that premium wine drinkers always think about, but um, like Germany is the highest purchaser of bulk wine and it's also the highest exporter because they purchase this bulk wine from all over the world, from Argentina, from the US, from Spain, repackage it and then export it to Wisconsin. It'll be in your Aldi. And so these- <laughs> like, Go get the a cat. Biggest, <laughs> <laughs> But the biggest producers and the biggest places, it's, it's such a, globalized production that it's really, um, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's really, really very cool to hear. Um, once again, I wanna merge a question I had with one that we are getting, which is, um, Angela, you had mentioned that there's been like a slight decline in um, kind of the wine industry profit. And a lot of our viewers had noted that it's, very often younger people choose craft beers or spirits over mm -hmm. wine um yeah. and so is the industry trying to attract a younger audience what do you think could be accounting for this gap and i want to add in this question from roger what are the strategies to kind of bring those younger people uh, into the wine category yeah absolutely i mean as we we think about your your typical demographic of a wine consumer it is older male and uh yeah, that's pretty much higher income, right? So, um, and as we think about, as Claire was talking about, when we plan our grapes and think about the future, obviously that uh, that demographic or that person I just described will probably not be here on earth, right? So it is it is something that we, we talk about consistently. Um, as I said before, we study the younger generations a lot just to, in terms of understanding why they, you know, why the attraction of RTDs, um, what's the barrier of wine? Um, and it was things that I had noted before, like wine is hard to understand. It's associated with just, you know, food pairings or a special occasion or something different. You know, we don't, people don't associate to like, I'm gonna go out and party, you know, like I'm gonna have a big night out, usually start with shots of vodka, which may not end up as a right decision at the end of the night, but it's different versus a girl's night in and you just share a bottle of wine and, and chat. So um, it's it's sort of the age old question that we, we 
we want to think about and, you know, ways of us tapping into cross uh, potential cross categorization um, between, you know, blurring, but using wine as a base. So things that we're always looking in terms of, you know, consumers these days, think about session sessionability. Uh, White Hall has in High Noon have done a really great job in terms of I'm going to convenience, as Claire was saying, alternative for formats, like I'm going to grab my can and hang out with my friends, lower ABV. These are things that can, um, will help from a sessionability perspective all day drinking. And uh, we did a focus group uh, a couple months ago on RTDs and this guy was like, yeah, I, I go to the convenience store and I buy my white claw and I drive around doing my errands drinking it. And I'm like, oh dear God, <laughs> you know, like what is going on here? So um, things that you find out from consumers is just really fascinating. So not that I encourage it, but as we think about pre-pandemic, there was a huge explosion of canned wines in the grocery stores. And I think mm -hmm. the pandemic killed that um, and retailers started shrinking those sets because nobody was going to concerts or going out to parks and stuff like that too. But I think as the reemergence of uh, our normalized life now, there is the opportunity of thinking of, you know, how do we create more convenience screw caps mm -hmm. so you don't have to, you know, bring your, you know, oh, I forgot to get my, you know, my, my corkscrew, you know, what, what, you know, so like the decisions, bad decisions, right? So um, how do we think about it? Bag wines, obviously a lot of conversations around that. So Kat, you can, carry one of our bags or bagnums to, you know, your next concert too as well. So we think about usage and occasions. Um, and then also how do we attract younger consumers? Because wine is hard to, a little bit harder to understand your knowledge needs to grow with that. Um, how do we think about, you know, external thinking on brands that do well and connect to consumers? And how do we do that with our brands? So Kelly Red is a great example, right? With Snoop. With Snoop Dogg, and he has brought in over 30, 30, 36% of all of uh, the consumers who purchase Kelly Red are new to wine. It oh. attracted acculturated Hispanics, uh, African Americans, mm -hmm. lower LDA, younger, you know, urban consumers. Mm -hmm. And so the, the power of messaging and marketing is really important. And then the, the repeat, right? We have over a 50% repeat rate on Kelly Red. It's an amazing wine. People love it. So it goes everything from understanding your consumers, creating the great, you know, the, the, the best wines possible uh, and, and, and building from that platform. So absolutely, it's something that we, we think about every single day, um, but also being true to ourselves too, right? So not just, I'm going to fit a, a round, you know, uh, a square peg in a round hole and saying, you have to, you have to drink my wine. It really needs to think about the consumers and, and what they want. Amazing. Claire, did you have anything to add? That's exciting about the um, new new purchases. Yeah. That makes yeah. me happy. It yeah. is, there's, yeah. um, so my little sister is also a badger and she is younger than me and has um, a lot of friends who don't drink at all. And I think that's becoming more and more common. Um, when mm -hmm. I was that age, I was definitely drinking, but not the nice wine that I sort of mm -hmm. seek after now. And I think one of the benefits of um, sort of the uh, critical um, opportunity that wine has inherently is that it is more complex. It's not something that is often associated mm -hmm. with binge drinking. And it's usually an experience that you share. You have a table of friends or a family, a meal. Um, and I think maybe I'm hopeful that as these younger people aren't trying to necessarily get drunk, but wine can be such a cultural experience and such an exchange of ideas. And even if you don't talk about the wine or even it really acknowledge it, it does bring friends and memories. And it's more than just a um, an ends to get drunk, <laughs> usually. Very true. Um, I want to ask you guys one more question from kind of my pile that I got from um, registrants, and then we're going to open it up. Um, we already have some great questions coming in from the Q&A, and I want to make sure we get to them. Um, so I want to ask kind of um, what tips and insights do you have for anyone who might be interested in getting into the business of wine? Um, and are there any skills in particular that are in demand for that? Claire, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I was a young person who got into wine sort of by accident. And I think um, one of the things that people on my side always cite is, oh my God, working that first harvest totally changed my life. 
oh, I took that hard left turn after working that first harvest. And, oh, I remember my first harvest. And it's, it really is, um, if you're interested in entering any part of production or even to get better, if you're on the sales team or if you're working in restaurants or you know, going from restaurant to restaurant, trying to distribute these wines, being able to see is really the magic that happens behind those cellar doors and experiencing this. You know, there's a reason it's associated with religion. It's really a spiritual, amazing experience that happens in this scientific format. But um, I would highly encourage anyone old, young, new to wine, enjoys wine, doesn't know anything about it to even go. There's wineries in Wisconsin. There's wineries in Minneapolis. There's wineries in every state. If you can take a weekend and say, hey, it's fall, grapes are coming in, like, I highly recommend doing that. And on um, sort of a broader scale, it's really, um, there's always positions open. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of skill sets are used. There's so many different aspects of the process as we've talked about. You know, you don't have to be able-bodied and working in the, the vineyard. You can have creativity on the marketing side and lots of options. Yeah, you can be like me and sit behind a computer all day long. Um, <laughs> so, but I, I think to to that point, you know, obviously there's so many different facets in, in the overall organization from SNLP, demand planning, forecasting, insights. You know, it's it really I think it goes back to uh, Claire's point of the, the passion of the business um, and the forward thinking and creativity. Right. As we look, you know, I was just so happened to be fortunate to land um, my position at Treasury just because they wanted to look at, they wanted external people to enter the business with a different lens. And I, I, I think, you know, I think that proves uh, the, the, the power of, of Treasury and wanting to think outside the box, right? It's not going to be years of years of generations that we're doing the same thing, but we need to think differently. And the, the ability to be creative and forward thinking and outward thinking and, and leverage everything around you is just, it, it's, it's, you know, the never ending uh, desire to, to learn and to do something new is, and I think that applies to any job, right? So um, I, I would just, I would say that. Um, but yeah, and I think it goes back to, you know, don't always feel like, um, and that challenge, you know, always when I challenge my team, like, are we talking to ourselves? If we talk about something, is it, is it something that we believe in or is it really about the consumer? So as we think about from an insights perspective, it always starts with the person who's at that LD, who's at that, you know, um, jewel, you know, purchasing that wine. It all starts with the consumer. Incredible. Thank you so much for that. I do appreciate it. We are going to turn now to um, questions that we're getting live. Um, so audience, feel free to um, pop them in the chat. We'll get through as many as we can um, before our time is out. So the first one that we have is for Angela. Um, and the question is, do you utilize data analytics to, determ to determine what taste profiles your target audience will like? Yeah, we, um, so with the brand in mind and our target consumers in mind, we do go through sensory tests with panelists, external panelists to judge it based on that scale of, I'll use Chardonnay for example, is it buttery, is it grassy with citrusy, um, oaky versus non. So, you know, we do that. And then we come back to what we think the consumers would like. Um, so a bit of both, right? Uh, a bit of, as Claire's talking about, like the old world of wines and the stylistics. And the, these are things that like a Behringer is true to, a Frank family is true to based on the, the styles of wine. And this is the essence and the history of it um, versus like a Cali Red or, you know, Cali Blanc, um, Martha, like these are, we know about the consumer. So it can, it can go from two different sides based on the history and heritage or a new to world brand um, and, and how we want to talk to our consumers. Okay, fascinating. Thank you. Um, and in turn for Claire, we have a question from Alex. Um, speaking of old world, are there any old world regions that are leading the way with their sustainability practices right now? That's a big question. I mean, um, I was working in Bordeaux last year. I was working in the vineyards and a lot of the marketing value there, they talk about having the highest percentage of organic vineyards in um, in Bordeaux, but there's also far fewer hectares or acres of vineyards in Bordeaux compared to the entire state of California. So it's it really depends on um, the metrics and 
you know, who's telling you the information. I think there is a lot of places that are doing a really amazing job and especially with the interest and sort of fascination with um, the consumers on learning about biodynamics and learning about organic um, productions that there are definitely places doing it better than others. And a lot of that will come down to the actual state regulations and then subsequently the Appalachians regulations. But um, I will be biased and we have a lot of organic vineyards down in Languedoc and south of France, but that's also climate permitting. We have cool, dry winds and we don't get a lot of rain where somewhere that is inherently wet and foggy and a different climate, you will need more protection and usually protection will then conflict with sustainability. But there are places that will use conventional winemaking or vineyard farming like using um, a chemical agent to fight mildew. And how do you then measure the sustainability? They have a systemic chemical that they're using that will now save them grass or gasoline. It'll save them soil compaction, less fewer runs through the vineyard on their tractors. So they're having less environmental impact on that side. So it's it's really complicated. And I don't think there's a maybe there's a more right answer, but I don't know if there's necessarily a singular right answer. But there's a lot of places that are doing good work and there are some places that aren't. And I don't know enough about all of the different regions to really speak too in depth about that. Fair enough, thank you. Um, while we wait for anybody who has any lingering questions, please do type them in the chat. Um, I wanna ask you guys something fun, which is kind of um, how do you go about like choosing a bottle of wine? Now that you know so much, do you have like a go-to type of grape or global region? Do you consider like your whole meal before picking out a bottle? Or is there just one that is your favorite? So I think for me, um, so I'm a, I'm a cab girl. I love just the, the full body earthiness of the, the different flavors that you get out of it. And it's just, it's like a meal in itself <laughs> pretty mm -hmm. much, you know, um, I, I, but I also challenge myself to think outwards and taste all the different types of, of wines. And so for me, it's, uh, trying to explore other countries. Like we were just talking about Italy before. And so, you know, in just the different styles. Um, so I, I think for me, I usually go into a store thinking, okay, what country of origin do I want to explore today? Since not traveling anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> so it's like, do I want to get a Chianti from Italy or, you know, Beaujolais from France or, you know, a Grenache from Spain. So, um, and then from there, just trying to, you know, looking at Appalachian and so forth. And then, and then price point, obviously I'm a consumer. At the end of the day, it has to be the right price point on my end. Um, but I also do love Pinot Noirs. Um, I think it's a very delicate, beautiful wine that gets sort of overlooked. Um, there's uh, Etude Pinot Noir is one of our portfolio that is just just amazing. It always surprises me how light and refreshing it is. But I think at the end of the day, it just it just really depends on like the mood I'm in that night and and what if I'm going to be like, I just want to do a cab because it's, you know, a red blend because I don't want to think about it. Or I really want to think about other countries and the different taste profiles it brings to, to the palate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm also a little biased towards Pinot Noir my first harvest working with Pinot, it's so beautiful. There's so many different expressions of it. But um, I think mostly when I'm choosing at this point, you know, the more you know, the more you don't know, the more you learn, the more you, you know, you have no idea. And so it's a lot of fun from my end as a consumer to ask for a recommendation from the, the server or if there's a beverage, you know, professional there, like, hey, I've never seen your wine list. You know, I'm interested in trying something new or I want something, I'm think, learning about this climate or this country. Do you have anything you'd recommend? And wine is such a conversation and such a shared um, opportunity that I, I like going about it that way. Oh, I love that. Wow, you guys really must have so many like under your belt. I'm kind of like, I feel like I stick to like three wines and I'm like these ones, I love them. But you, you know guys you like. like, yeah, you know what you like, which is great. Well, you can yeah. say that, but we can hold two <laughs> hands and two hands to truth. So we should we should branch out. I think I should take take a page from your book. You um, should come to Napa. Just come to Napa, and we'll sh I'll show you around. <laughs> oh, do it! Don't don't just say yeah. that. <laughs> um, 
one question that we've gotten from viewers is, do either of you guys have any thoughts on winemakers who aren't growing their own grapes, but are instead importing them to make them in a place that they don't necessarily grow well? How common is that? Um, and any thoughts? Yeah, yeah I've it's, worked in, or here. Yeah, go, ahead. No, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, you first. I've worked in wineries that have done it both ways and it depends on the history of the place and the the sort of standard of operation that is there. Like in Napa, I know, like I was working in Sonoma and a lot of these vineyards are owned by private families or companies. And even those companies that own it or the family that owns the land, there's a different company farming it and maybe a different company buying the grapes. And these are either short-term contracts, long-term contracts, where in, in the Wama Valley, where I've worked, a lot of them are more estate vineyards. And then you go to France in Burgundy, where one person might own three wine, three vines, plants in a row, and there's 200 owners for each hectare. So it's there's a lot of different ways, and um, neither is better or worse. It just adds more variables, and a lot of places that um, you don't own your own vines, it really reduces a lot of risk because this is a natural product. Like we had hail here in France in 18, and we lost an entire year's worth of income. So it's it's good at um, distributing the risk and gives wineries opportunities to try different varieties or different microclimates or uh, really experiment on many different sides. I like being in the vineyard and working with the grapes. I know all the decisions that went into that vine and I remember pruning it and that's a whole different thing that you can do. You can do it both ways. Yeah, and as you think about that perfect bottle, sometimes it's not 100% one grape, right? So we do purchase mm -hmm. wines from other, uh, you know, other companies to to produce. So, you know, even from a Chianti, it's like you have your Sangiovese, but then you also may blend it with a Merlot or something to get that right balance as we talk mm -hmm. about what the brand essence should be in the style. So sometimes it's not 100% from our estate, but it's blending from other sources um, to get that that perfect that perfect bottle. Mm. That makes sense. Very, very insightful, you guys. Thank you. Um, any last minute questions from the group? I'll give them like a hot second and a half, but I will just say, I think that's, I think that's going to be all. So I want to say thank you huge, huge, deep thank you um, for coming and sharing your time and your insights with us. Um, this has been, I know to me, I've learned so much already. Um, and you guys have been so wonderful in making the winemaking industry so accessible and um, exciting for all of us here. So a huge, huge thank you. Um, and thank you so much also for all of you guys who tuned in live today and those of you who sent in questions can't do it without you. Um, and I really, really appreciate your engagement and the desire to know more and make the most of our time with these amazing, amazing panelists with insights and experiences. I'm really very impressed by. So a huge, huge thank you. Um, and we'll be signing off. So uh, keep your eyes out for future business ofs um, as we do them in the next uh, rest of the upcoming year, business badgers. And thank you again. Have a good rest of your day.